This past week, there was a story on the news. It came at the very end, after all the hoopla and scary controversy about the elections, after the coverage of the wars, after the coverage of the devastation of the hurricanes, there was this story at the very end that was so beautiful. It was about a man, his name is Keith Johnson. He's 84 years old and he lives in Washington State. Keith Johnson adopted a dog at the shelter 13 years ago, and he named her Gita. She is a mutt, but she is big and very shaggy, kind of like a huge sheepdog, multiple colors, black and white, browns, and just hair all over the place. Keith and Gita have that kind of connection that some of us have experienced with a pet, you know, that's beyond words. Keith decided to go spend some time in a cabin in the woods in Washington State. And of course, he had to bring Gita. And one morning, he was letting Gita outside and had stepped outside the front door when he felt dizzy and strange and he fell on the driveway and he heard his hip crack. He felt this searing pain and it hurt to move. He didn't have a cell phone with him. There was no one around for miles. Gita came and sniffed around him realizing that something was off because he wasn't getting up. And she sat down and just looked at him. And for a full hour, they just stared at each other. And then Keith had an idea, or a hope, you could say. He glared at Gita and he said, Gita? Go get help. Go on, girl. Go get help. Gita looked right at him, and she took off down the driveway. Keith was left alone. Gita, meanwhile, ran to the road where she sat on the double yellow lines and just waited. A cop car drove up. Seeing this dog and the huge dog in the center of the road, of course, he pulled to a stop and the cop tried to get Gita in the cop car so he could drive her around and maybe figure out where she lived or bring her to a shelter. But when he tried to approach her, she would back up and bark. And then she would look this way and bark. Come on, get in the car. No, she kept barking and sitting there, glaring at him furiously and looking off to the side. The cop got frustrated and thought about just leaving her there. This was a very strange and badly behaved dog, he thought. But there was something about her that seemed kind of urgent. So he said, all right, what's going on with you, girl? She walked a little ways and turned back and looked at him. He followed her. She walked further and looked back. I'm coming, he said, I'm coming. Gita led him all the way through the woods to her master, who still was lying in the driveway. The cop knelt down to Keith and said, Sir, 
I want to tell you, you have one good dog. In today's gospel, Jesus is walking around the Galilee with his disciples and he's performing miracles and he's talking about God and everything's going well. And James and John, two of his disciples, decide that they think they know how things should go with Jesus and they want to be part of what they consider to be the winning team. I think of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, as kind of brawly big guys, competitive, ambitious. Their father Zebedee owned multiple boats, so he had a sort of a fishing business. So maybe they grew up a little bit like good businessmen, you know, learning about how to be better all the time, striving, achieving. James and John, think they know how Jesus's ministry should go. They've got the course all mapped out for him, the way he should behave, where he should go, how he should defeat the Romans. And when he gets to his victory dinner, they want to be sitting right there. Now, in some families, where you sit at the dinner table is still important even today. My grandmother was like that. She got every single person a napkin holder with our name on it. And when we came for the holidays, you'd know if she was pleased with you because you'd be sitting closer to her. If you were in the doghouse, you'd be on the other end of the table. You could tell everything based on how she set the table. Well, the Jews believed that in heaven there would be a table set. And these guys thought, well, Jesus will be ruling everybody. And when he gets to the victory meal, they said, ah, they want to be on the right and on the left. That was their goal. That was their vision. That was their directive. So they come up to Jesus and, oh, they try to sort of manipulate him, you know, which never works with Jesus. But they say, Lord, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. <laughs> and Jesus says, okay. What is it that you ask of me? And they say, when you get to your kingdom, we want to sit one on your right and one on your left. Jesus says to them what he says to them a lot. He basically says, you guys just don't get it. You don't know what you're asking. That's not the way things work with God. You're going to be baptized with a baptism that I'll be baptized with. But I cannot tell you where you'll be seated at the table. Of course, when the other disciples find out that the James and John were trying to elbow their way to the top, they get mad. And Jesus says, none of you gets it. There are no winners and losers in heaven. Things work differently. It is not something that you can comprehend. You must trust me. And in the book of Job, you know the story of Job. The poor guy has a lot of money and a great big family and all's going well. And then all of a sudden, everything bad happens to the guy. His family all dies. He loses all of his money. He's sitting in the dirt with sores all over his skin. And he basically says the question that I think we all ask when life gets hard. Job says, why? Why are you doing this to me? And God's answer is, as Christine read so beautifully, you can't get it. Were you here when I threw the stars into the heavens? Were you here when I crafted the oceans? Do you know how a bird finds its prey? I cannot tell you why, because you are not capable of understanding. 
You know, when it comes to our lives, I think we're a lot like that cop. We have a route picked out for our lives. We're supposed to drive our car and we're gonna have love and we're gonna make enough money and we're gonna have some fulfillment and we're gonna die very old and we have it all planned out, we have it all mapped out, our course. And then the Holy Spirit plops down and sits right in front of the road. And something bad happens or something stops us and, and we say, what's going on here? And we don't understand. And the question will be, do we drive around that shaggy dog or do we say, something's going on here and I guess I need to follow. Even though I don't understand the language, I don't understand why, maybe I need to follow because this this creature, this sign, this otherworldly thing, this will take us to where people are hurting, where we're needed, where we will be Christ's hands and feet in this world. We have a woman in our parish who has become a close friend, and, and I love her dearly. Many of you know her because she's been a public figure here in Jacksonville, Audrey Moran. Audrey's been the, the head of our big homeless shelter, the Soulsbacher Center, and she's been the vice president of Baptist Health Systems, and she's a judge. She's amazing and smart and funny and kind. Audrey was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer three and a half years ago, the really aggressive kind that spreads everywhere. By the way, I, I called her to see if it was okay to talk to her, talk to you about her, and she said, sure. <laughs> Audrey never expected that this would happen to her. And yet, she decided that she wasn't going to get into the business of feeling sorry for herself or wondering why this was happening. She said, I just can't go there. It doesn't give me any answers. It doesn't help. But I do know this. I am so blessed to have lived the life I've lived. And I am so blessed to get the best medical care here in Jacksonville. And, and my friends have been amazing and I wanna talk about dying, and I wanna talk about looking forward to what's next, and I wanna prepare my funeral, and I wanna have my relatives be prepared. And, and I realized Audrey, who's been a leader, was still being a leader. And so I, I said, can I podcast with you? That's just basically my cell phone and a microphone. I don't do it very well, but I do have a podcast. So I podcasted with her. It's, it's only 10 minutes. And I sent it to her thinking she would enjoy hearing it. Well, she sent it to a friend who sent it to a friend who sent it to a friend. And this past week, almost everywhere I went, someone in Jacksonville says, oh, thank you for your podcast with Audrey. One woman said, I've never thought about death like that, that I didn't have to run away from it that I could face it with that kind of courage. You know what the word Gita means, the name of that dog? It's a Hindi word, like the Bhagavad Gita. It means song. I don't think we're gonna be able to rationally understand why certain things happen to us, why the path that we would want for our lives tends to veer off course, why there's divorce and war and bankruptcy and we lose our jobs and we get sick. I don't know if we're ever going to understand that in this life. I think the scripture tells us that we're not capable of understanding that. But what we can do is recognize the shaggy dog who interrupts our routine, the song of God, which takes all different shapes and sizes and forms 
from animals to people to things you read to insights and ideas. But what I do know is that there are moments when the Holy Spirit will break into your life and lead you somewhere you could have never foreseen and usually lead you to a place where you can act a little bit like Jesus, where you can help and heal and bring some light. The song of God, for God is constantly singing to you, calling you, come on, come with me. I know you don't understand, but come over here. Because over here I see someone who needs you. Gita, God's song, listen for it, it's always singing, amen.